Are there any adjustments to the agenda? Um, a motion to approve the minutes of Monday, December 19th. So moved. Will you do my second, Bill? I'll second. Bill second? Okay. Sarah, moved. Okay. So we have a, any discussion on those minutes? Other than that, it was a very impressive meeting. Mm -hmm. All around. All right. Hearing none, so moved. Except it was impressive. Uh, board correspondence and communications. Anything to me? All right, public comments. Uh, raise your hand if you have a public comment. All right. Do you have another public comment? Yeah. Okay. On, whoops. We're on reports to the board. Amy. Uh, so yeah, my report in hand, I wanted to add a few things, uh, oral updates based on work that's happening in the legislature right now. Um, I did attend a legislative update on Thursday um, that was sponsored by the VSA. So um, one is there's, uh, there's a bill that's been passed in regards to open meeting laws and also changing um, the provision around how on our articles uh, for our annual meeting, we have to currently warn member, it talks about the percentage around per pupil spending. It changes that, not requiring that. It is still on the governor's desk and has not been signed yet. Um, we have adopted a bunch of our warnings already my plan was to just continue to move forward with what we've adopted. Uh, actually, I feel like that language in most of our districts is pretty sound this year. The CLA is what is impacting us more so than necessarily per pupil spending. Um, and so anyways, I just in case you, some of you probably got that update around the VSA, know that I've been following that and it has not, it does not currently have the governor's signature. We expect that it will either have his signature one of three things will happen. He'll sign it, he'll veto it, or he will just let it go into law without signing it. We expect that to happen by the end of the week. One of those three things. That's really late in the game for many of us around we need to get our book or books to the printers. So we're just rolling with what we've got. I just wanted to say that. Other big topics um, is there's a large report that came out around child care in the state um and funding of child care and pre-k programming there was a sense on thursday that that could pick up some steam meaning that the legislature could possibly try to take that up um, as you all know I'm a, I'm a huge proponent of um early ed and pre-k um although i did remind the legislature that our budgets have been adopted in many districts in asking schools to change what their pre-K layout is for next year, it's really late in the game. So please don't pass something without funding behind it, is what I, I specified to the legislature. I think we're all supportive of that work, but please don't have a mandate locally um, for districts to cover it, The which there's talk that could happen. So we're gonna follow that bill closely uh, our proposed bill. I do believe something is going to come out about child care and early ed this year out of that, the um, House Ed Committee. Uh, universal meals, I try to put that back on the radar uh, because rem reminder that it is only funded for this year. I'm concerned about it falling off the radar. We have many, many new members to the House and Senate Ed Committees, and I, I did not want them to forget that that's not funded past this year. Um, and so uh, I, along with some of my colleagues, reminded folks of that. The nice thing is every member was in attendance last Thursday with the soup, so we had good access to talk these things through. Um, the other thing that, um, that certainly we re-raised re last Thursday in the group I was with is the idea of diversifying um, how we fund the Ed Fund. 
meaning is there an opportunity to relook at funding of the Ed FUD so it's not just falling on property tax. And examples in some of our districts and towns right now where the CLA has dropped significantly, we are seeing uh, major increases in tax rates, not because of the actual Ed spending per pupil, but because of the CLA adjustment, um, which is something that I'll have a letter that's coming out out of the SU office to our community this week and will be in the Herald, trying to help folks understand how the common level of appraisal influences tax rates um, after budgets have been put to bed and revenues and things of that nature. So that's something that, that was raised um, with the legislature. They're, um, one of the things I think is really exciting is that they um, are conducting a study in regards to um, deferred maintenance that's occurred throughout the state. I was able to be on a panel with four other superintendents to speak to the group. Um, and I talked about how we're leveraging ESSER funding and performance contracting to be able to address three of our failed boiler systems in the SU um, without having to add to the tax rate of our local districts. Performance contracting is something that um, in some corners of the state, I don't think it's been necessarily embraced. It is something that's allowing us to do this work um, and make certain we can keep our schools open and vibrant. I also said that many of our boards have been working hard to put reserves away to be able to deal with deferred maintenance and that unfunded mandates out of the legislature could result in our inability to do that pre-planning in our budgets. Um, and so that was something that I raised on the panel is that we're trying to work hard to put money away and put reserves away and, ha and that we are that we have started to work around a capital facilities plan, but having additional costs be handed down, um, even though most of it is all good work, right? With good intentions could result in us having to kick the can down the road and we really can't afford to in our facilities. Um, and so that was raised with the hopes being maybe that they'll start to set aside some money to help support districts uh, with deferred maintenance. Um, and so those are the legislative updates that I had beyond my report. And I'd be happy to take any questions folks may have. The only other update I would offer before we move on is that um, also it was just an email just went out from the VSBA that Phil Gore has resigned as a board development uh, coordinator. Um, must be very recently because it just was announced today. Wow. Just, I just have comments on a question. Um, if public schools are going to survive any place in this world, they could have strong, effective, articulate advocates. And that takes all of us. And I'd like to appreciate and uh, commend our superintendent for being there and understanding the importance of it. And it's it's with the kids, it's with the classrooms, it's with our teachers, it's with our boards, all of us. But it's also with the legislators and educating them about what's important and what's essential and why. And that effort is just, we, we can't do it without the legislature being informed, educated, and seeing the light. And uh, so I really appreciate that. We need that. We can't do it alone. And CLA is one example of it where, why well, should, because it, uh, I'm from Stockbridge, and for whatever reason, we're close to Killington. So there are a lot of people that are interested now in ski houses and everything else. So they're jacking up the prices. So our common level of appraisal can't keep up with it. So are you going to take it out in the backs of our students? Yeah. The students that I happen to believe that one reason we've got strong property values is that we've got a good school system. But that doesn't mean we should be penalized for that. So that, that the idea of deferred maintenance um, and the importance that we have to do that as a team effort. Um, and the meals, universe of meals, and I'll, I'll conclude with the community conversations and, and I've been a pleasure to, to attend those. Those are really good. And the atmosphere and the room, the rooms 
is positive. It isn't like people are burning and they're, they're they got the, the, the spears out and they're ready to throw the tomatoes. No, it's wanting to learn more, how to support more, have a conversation. And I think that forum appears to be working very well. And I commend you and the team for figuring out that this is a good grant to go for and to do it. And the community conversation is really going to pay off. I know in our community, uh, when we're asking them to, to be looking at paying more, not because of this, what we're, we're overcharging the schools, but the CLA. So we're building a community support system that's essential. So thank you very much. Very much appreciated that you're keeping track of it, Jamie. I agree with that 100%. All right. Anybody else for Jamie before we move on? Thank you, Jamie. Hi. Thank you. Uh, so fairly uh, succinct report this week because we've got um, some academic data to look at as well. Uh, this is one of the weeks that we have um, a half day in service that we've dedicated to SUY professional learning. Uh, as we've talked about all year, these are, this is an opportunity to really leverage both some of the resources we have through federal, uh, the federal grants um, to bring in uh, facilitators of that learning in, in a lot of cases um, and be able to also bring our teachers together from across our school. So we've got next generation science standard um, professional learning being led by VINs. Um, that brings uh, teachers from every single one of our schools and districts in, in to talk about science. We've got math, PD, uh, literacy, both at the early, at the elementary level as well as an adolescent literacy um, workshop series that the Stern Center has put together, particularly for us to address some of the questions that we've got around literacy at the older grades. Um, we've got work on uh, social um, trauma-informed social learning, uh, and as well as looking at um, data. Uh, and how to have that inform your practices. So a lot of a lot of different things going on. This is the third session. It's been a bit of a break since the last one we had at the end of October, just the way our um, our PD schedule works out. Uh, and then we'll have two more that follow in March and May, and that will be sort of to complete the series. Some of these courses will continue next year. Some people sort of signed up for two-year courses. I think they know that. Um, if, the, if the learning was really deep, particularly around uh, math as a second language uh, and the comprehensive reading course, they're both two-year courses. So people will be able to continue with those uh, next year. So we have to adopt a calendar that, that supports that. Uh, we'll talk about the uh, state summative assessment results that um, are from last spring. And then the last piece of that, that we continue to update you on, but I just I think about it a lot, uh, is the work uh, around the, um, the curriculum work that started at the high school, but it's also um, working through middle school and elementary teachers right now. And I think about this in particular from an equity perspective and ensuring that, you know, regardless of, you know, which town our students are in and what school they attend within our SU, that we know that they're getting a high quality education. And, um, and this work really works to ensure that both we use what's um, what's locally relevant, but also hold all of our schools and students to, to high standards across and use the best research there. So I think that work has really come together. Mikhail Martin's been working on that and leading that. And um, it's been really uh, great to see the progress being made there. And I think um, by the end of this year, we'll have some incredibly good documents uh, across all of our all of the grade levels um, that will really support our teachers in, in helping students get to those high levels uh, at each grade level. So I can take questions on any or comments on anything there, and then we can move to the state summative results. Honda, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so I've been thinking in that in a town like Stratford, and I know uh, Tunbridge and Chelsea and Sharon are pretty much in the same uh, bag, and and other towns in our district where we spend an incredible amount of money on secondary tuition and we have absolutely no control and no way to see um, how our students are doing. And as in fact, are the schools that they're going to, um, are they worth the money we spend on them, you know? And so is the, would this help us get some of that information? The work around the curriculum work? Yeah, you said that you know it would it, we'd see what was our students were being taught and and so um, I just you know it I mean there's just when we we give so much money to independent and private schools and other public schools yeah. and we have no no say in them and I mean it's in in Stratford it's a huge percentage of our of our um, 
budget. And then if anything was to be cut, it has to be cut from our elementary budget because we, we are bound by the, the, um, uh, the tuition that we have to pay. And we have absolutely no say. And we have no idea whether our students are doing, um, doing well. <laughs> Sarah, it's a, it's a great question. I think on, this, on the last part, we should have a better idea of, who's do, of how they're doing, and, and we can work on that to, to sort of bring that information um, together. Obviously, the schools have their own own data. Um, so, but I think, you know, I think we can put our heads together, too, to get a better understanding of how, you know, how our students are doing as, as they leave and head into other, other schools. I think the other piece that is important is, um, I think this aligns really well to the, the board's goal of making the White River Valley High School a really viable option for everyone. And I think the more that we're clear about what it is that we want students to be able to uh, know and be able to do by the time they leave you know, the, the high school um, and how that vertically aligns well to what they're doing in you know, first through eighth grade and, and, or sixth grade or whatever, wherever the, the last grade is in all of our other schools, um, it makes for a really, um, cohesive experience for our students um, and the more that we can show that and, and you know the students and families will make you know different choices but I think the the more that our that our own system uh, is able to talk to, to to its to itself and align with itself will also be helpful for our students so that the experience that they're having as they move through our schools whether that's you know going all the way up to the high school um, really builds on itself uh, and doesn't have sort of any kind of disconnects within it, like you, you know, a sudden like, well, I'm not going to go to the high school because it doesn't actually, you know, doesn't align well with the experience I had, in, you know, in another town, but it, that it more and more makes sense as a whole system. Yeah, and maybe what I'm talking about is more legislative type thing, um, you know, and accountability. I just, you know, we, and we hold our teachers accountable for a quality education that we employ um, in, our, in our administration, and yet we have I mean, so much, I don't know, it's, it's for another conversation at another time, but it's been kind of uh, ruminating in my mind. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. All right. Let me switch over to the, uh, the other report. So there, um, you got a report in your packets, which includes the the information that was most recently released by the Vermont Agency of Education on the state's performance on uh, SBAC, uh, the reading and reading and math, uh, some of the state assessments. We um, we have looked at some of this. We looked, certainly looked at this data last year, uh, and we treated last year as, as a baseline year because of the um, the fact that we didn't test kids in twenty. 20 uh, due to the pandemic. So 2021 was sort of a restart, 2022 being the second year. So that's why in most of these you're looking at two years of uh, two years of data. Uh, we can look at a couple of the graphs um, just to get a, a little bit of a better understanding. But I think in, in general, the story here is that we are, we're tracking very closely to how the state overall, how the state performed across both content areas and grade levels. Uh, I will say that in some places we certainly saw a good um, good growth. In other places, we did not see the growth we would have liked to have seen. Uh, I think it also reflects how we felt about the year as it went last year in terms of how much of instruction was disrupted due to uh, any number of absences at the student level, at the cl whole class level, at the teacher level. Uh, and it was a much more disruptive uh, instructional year than I think we expected when we started uh, in September of last year. And so I think we, I think we do see that in the data and the and the quote from the Secretary of Education was just sort of this long shadow of, of COVID that we're seeing um, in um, things like this, which you know assess a, a accumulation of, of different material that you can't make up necessarily in you know one good month of attendance right before uh, the test period. This, you know this this reflects sort of you know multiple years of of learning um, and where things have been successful and where they've been um, disrupted. So. Uh, the first graph that you see uh, in the in the packet it has our um, our scale score across the SU in English language arts as it compares to the state scale score and as it compares to what they've marked as the proficiency benchmark. So if you're looking at it in color, it's it's green for WRVSU, gray for the state, and then black for the proficiency benchmark. So across each grade level, we are either I mean we're just right at the state's 
sometimes above it in one in two grade levels, a little below it, three grade levels. Um, and at grade five meeting sort of the, the proficiency benchmark for for ELA. So this is looking just at those grade levels last year. And the graph uh, following that is looking at our proficiency. So the total percentage of students in each grade level who are proficient or above uh, in English language arts. This is looking over both two years. So 2020 and 20, sorry, 2021 and 2022. Um, and yeah, that's just, that's proficient and above. Uh, and in each pair, it's the, the SU versus the, and then, then the state follows that. So you sort of look at sort of a group of four columns together for grade three and then the next four. So in most cases you see sort of both the, the SU and the state going down from two years ago to last year. Um, and I think that that, ex that is an example of just where we're seeing sort of the ongoing effects of, of this disrupted learning. Uh, and then the last one uh, for ELA across the whole SU is looking, this is really aligns to our board, uh, our SU goals around um, English language proficiency and the annual target set uh, you all set as a as a board to see how we get to exceeding proficiency in ELA based on where we started last year. Uh, the two bars represent actual scores, average um, scores of our students in each of those grade levels in 2021 and 2022. And then the, the lines represent the, the targets that we're aiming for over the next three years. So again, grade five, we're, we're seeing that we've met, we've kind of met that target for last year. Uh, in grade four, a little bit of an increase, in grade eight, a little bit of an increase, and then a little bit decreases it um, in three, six, eight, and nine. So some work to some work to be made up there. So we've got the same set of three graphs for math. I can pause on you. I can just I'll just keep going. Someone will interrupt me if they need to. Uh, I will just and it's uh, we had a we started from kind of a lower spot of math. It's not an area that we had been focusing on as much. Uh, we certainly made some really good growth uh, in our elementary grades, um, and I'd like to see that we're definitely approaching the the goals that we set in the proficiency benchmark. There, uh, the drop off I think between 2021 and 2022 is smaller. Um, for math, so I think we really are focused there where we put in. Uh, some more time and resources and some intervention has helped in um, in supporting that work last year. And if we look at where we are compared to our targets uh, towards 2025, uh, more upward progression towards those goals. Um, not quite as big jumps as we'd like to see in order to get to um, matching that proficiency line in, in black and the stars, but uh, the the move from 2021 to 2022 is generally uh, up, upwards and positive, and so heading in the right direction there. The last set of graphs, I won't go through all that. That's just our co by cohort, um, looking at current, current grade level versus how those students did last year when they were the previous grade level. So well, usually when we're looking at the other graphs, we're looking at last year's third graders uh, or sorry, you're looking at each of the grade levels as they are. Um, and this is looking at the same the same group of students for the most part, moving from one grade level to the next. So it tracks a little bit more how that cohort is doing rather than how's the curriculum instruction going in that class, in that grade level. Uh, two, maybe a couple of things just to note as you look at that data, that we've got two grade levels where we, the number of students dramatic, dramatically changes. Let's go to get that sort of Sarah's comment earlier. When we have students move from sixth to seventh grade, our numbers went from uh, just about 90 down to a little under 70. So it's just overall, you know, you're losing a close to a fifth of the students. And then again, from when we students move from eighth to ninth grade, we go from having uh, 53 to 34. So you're just you're using a lot fewer students to look at um, at the at their academic scores there. So it's gonna it's gonna be a lot noisier number because one or two students can throw it off a lot more when the numbers get so much smaller. Throughout our elementary, we're, you know, we're above between 105 and 113, 14 for each grade level. And so those stay a little bit more consistent from grade to grade. 
we're talking about about you know we've got kids moving in and out but it's about the same kids whereas we, we have a much different you know we have a, a substantially different set of kids in um seventh grade and then again in ninth grade Uh, and then to complicate everything else, we have no idea how these, these scores will compare to the new summit of state that we will try out this year uh, in May, which we, they're calling VTCAP, Vermont Comprehensive Assessment Program. Uh, the same subject areas will be tested, math, English language arts, and uh, science as well. But, um, and the current company has been asked to, to do a study to compare uh to see how how comparable the, the the two sets of tests are but at this point i think that i think we can consider that an unknown about whether we can look at these same types of um uh data visualizations and wonder whether we're comparing the same things at all so we may we may be starting with a new baseline there may be a way to sort of translate um one set of of um assessments over to the other and still figure out how we're growing Question um, on the two graphs that have vertical bars, kind of like the Syracuse <laughs> orange men and the Vikings, if we want to split the analogy to the sports, but college and, and pro, but you've got the orange and the, the purple. I'm looking at the for English language right now. Are these uh, co-arts, uh, are these different kids? In other words, the kids yeah. last year that were in the third grade and now the kids this year they're in third grade? Different kids, yep. So they're different kids. So yes. it's really hard to, it tells you that the kids changed and they've got, all, in this case, in, in most cases, uh, uh, couldn't keep up. But we don't know how much of that is COVID or how much of that is just the kids. Right? Yeah, so, we, the, what, so that's why we did the graphs at the end, which are the same kids. So you could look at your, right at your fourth grader, current fourth graders, and know that the the graph the bar on the left side is the is their performance in third grade last year or two years ago and then their performance in fourth grade last year so this this is what you're looking for in terms of looking at actual uh how that group of students is doing the other graph is telling us like if we consistently saw that you know maybe there was a dip at sixth grade well what are we doing in terms of um, our, you know, our materials, our curriculum, our instruction at that grade level that is, is agnostic of what kids are there, that what, what do we need to be doing maybe differently um, with how we're instructed. These are not totally separate, but that's, there's two different ways to sort of think about it and look at the, at the data. All right, thank you. Does that make sense of it? Yeah. yeah it's why the, the bottom graph on those, right, is third grade. We don't have comparison data for them. They don't take it as second grade. So it's just that they're, they're sort of sitting there at the, at the bottom of one line. Okay. Okay. Any questions? Thank you. Good stuff. Thanks. Good stuff. All right. And we are. We are at a Thank you. I'm sorry I'm not there in uh, in person. I'm a little under the weather. I thought I would keep 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 my germs to myself. Um, so my report just uh, highlighted. I'm doing the the rule change spotlight. So for this month, uh, my spotlight was on um, annual goals for IEPs, um, and really a lot of the information in the bulleted list um, was things that were already in place, and I think they just wanted them written out and highlighted. Um, with the rule changes, um, but the the most notable is that IEPs need to be written in a SMART goal format. So that's you know specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. Um, so those are that's the main thing um, to notice. Uh, the next part that I wanted to highlight was just um, some updates in our data. Um, so in December every year, we do um, child count um, into the Vermont AOE. Um, and so this is what our numbers you know, have, have looked like for the past four years. I also wanted to highlight some of our disability categories over time. So these are kind of the top four, not in any specific order, um, but these are our top four. Um, the last one is developmental delay, which is um, our early childhood, so our, our pre-K. 
Um, those are kind of what the numbers have, have looked like over the years. Um, what I wanted to, to just note was that we're kind of starting to see a downward trend with our specific learning disability. But um, if you can, if you just notice, there's kind of this upward trend with an emotional disability, and there's kind of this upward trend happening um, with other health impairment. Um, and that's something that's just been um, noted um, in a lot of um, behavioral research and things um, since the pandemic. Um, so this kind of our, our research is, is, um, is kind of going on the same, same path as um, state and national data. Um, the next couple of graphs I also wanted to just note was um, just the number of referrals, which is blue. And I only have data for um, last year and this year, um, since that's when I've, I've been taking the data here. Um, and this is just for the 23, this is currently what we're at for right now. Um, so if, if just kind of seeing the trend, it looks like it's going to be on a downward trend, just kind of making a, a guesstimate uh, based on where we're at currently. Um, with the number of referrals that are coming in for our supervisory union. Um, but what I did want to note too is also our initial evaluations is, is also going to be on this downward trend, but initial evaluations that are completed, um, we have to complete an initial evaluation by law if um, students move in from out of state. Um, so if they were eligible out of state um, for special education, by law, we have to perform an initial evaluation here in the state of Vermont to see if they meet our criteria. So that's, that's just something to note um, with the red initial evaluations completed. This is the biggest one that I wanted to highlight was the um, out of district. Um, the number of students that were having attend therapeutic or behavioral um, independent schools that kind of specialize in, in these areas. Um, if you look um, at the number of students from our FY 2022 to my estimated um, FY 24, we're definitely on a downward trend, um, which means our alternative classrooms at our supervisory union level are helping, plus all of the social emotional and um, kind of alternative academic um, curriculums and things that, that we're doing uh, within our supervisory union is working. So it's nice to see, you know, that our, that MTSS system that, you know, we've, we've been talking about um, is really starting to make changes. Um, and so I'm just really proud of that, of that data. Um, and Michaela and I will have a presentation later on this evening, a little bit more about um, what intervention and specialized instruction can look like at the MTSS levels. Um, but any questions? Okay. Yeah, I just, I wanted to take the opportunity to highlight to the board, we've been talking about how we've stabilized special ed spending, but then the ad FTEs just a reminder that for every one of those decreases of out-of-district placements, a good figure to use is 100,000. Some are more, some are a little less, but think about that as 100,000 per, per student. So that, that is part of how we've been able to continue to reinvest in adding some positions and things, but you not seeing your special ed budget go up. Nice. Thank you, that's great, Annette. Good job. Good work, guys. All right. Uh, we are on to. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. You have my report, which outlines what's happening in February in the business office for both business office staff, school food authority. And then I did add in my report this month, um, just down at the bottom, the other projects that I'm working on for the rest of this month and then into February. And if there's any questions. Thanks for doing a great job so far on the budget season. Thank you. Everybody's getting their 
stuff done. And ready. Okay. Hopefully everyone has <laughs> had a chance to uh, review my report. There's information in here about uh, NESDEC, the New England uh, School Development Council, uh, our data dashboard, EduClimber, the strategic plan books, which you will be seeing in the next couple of weeks, and uh, improving communication with uh, TVs, uh, providing updates in our lobbies. And I would entertain any questions. Yeah, I was going to uh, ask that we focus on goal number four, action item 4.6, develop population projections, which you're working with with the New England School Development Council. But it's the last sentence that you have in there. One thing we can share is that Vermont is projected or is projecting to have to lose almost 10 percent of its pre-K to 12 student population between 2020 and 2030. Now, if you think about that and talk about fewer kids in the classroom and cost per kid, and that's the big fixation. And you just can't take, okay, I'll just remove a finger or a hand of our teachers and they'll save us money or we'll just consolidate everything else. That is something that I think we should, um, I suggested a, a future agenda item, talk about that one of our strategic goals is to be marketing our successes, being good, letting the population know we're being good so that we can attract kids that have a choice, the parents have a choice to our system because it's better. Yeah, I have the, the towns are better too, but I'll, I'll stick it with that. But if you look at this trend, is that mission impossible? To me, if we don't do everything possible to market our wares as be the best there is, um, we're going to be at a point where um, the, the, the Jamies of the world aren't going to be able to keep pulling the rabbits out of the hat. Um, so I just suggest that we, I don't have an answer to that other than being good and then letting people know that we're really, really, really good. Because um, I don't think it has to happen here. And I think we've got so much assets, human capital and people and an environment that we could really do it here. But that's kind of scary. Yeah. Well, uh, the reason it says, you know, that you could share that is uh, NASDAQ is out of Massachusetts. Um, and so there were some certain things I had to follow up with them about our structure that uh, influenced the ratios they were using about the population projection. So, so you think that might be off? No, 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 no. That, because that's about the state. It's not just yeah. WRBSU, but uh, hope, to, hope to have uh, an update for you uh, in the future. Talk to them uh, yesterday. They tried to clear those things up, and we got them some new numbers today. Yeah, so we'll have population projections for each of the member districts and the SU. And the goal would be that we continue to do those annually, and we expect to be able to dial in better by year three. Yeah, and we... Any questions for Ray? Uh, policy committee update on board member conduct policy. Uh, we, uh, that policy, we got our first look at at the policy committee meeting tonight. We made a couple of changes. It's going to come back to the committee. Um, next month for another review and then hopefully we'll be able to pass that along to the committee to the board to look at one well, question i had to the policy committee on this or and it's drafted by our our legal team it's it's are we primarily or exclusively talking about our behavior our civility as not as board members but when we step into the boardroom when we step to the community meeting when we are on a Zoom meeting, is, is it basically that's where this applies? Or does it mean also that when I'm down at the post office and talking to somebody and, and somebody's um, being very obnoxious about how terrible I'm doing in my job and, and I explode and I basically said, well, 
on and on and on it goes. Uh, we also talked about that behavior too as not, in other words, does the board membership civility rules go beyond when we're in this room to how we deal with people uh, when they're talking about school policy. I'm not talking about sports or um, the Red Sox or something like that. I'm talking about school policy. Are we still held by this policy to be civil? Or not? That's my question. When you're conducting board business, so when you're representing the board under board business, that's there. You cannot, we cannot legally, the board cannot extend past that and censor. So it's basically when we step into the boardroom or committee, yep. or as a board, you're, you're representing the board at a school event, right? So I think a good example could be Bill. I think it's really clear when that when board members are coming to community conversations, I don't think you get to take your board member hat off. I think it's been clear to folks you're wearing your board member hat. If that gotcha. hat. I would consider that to be board business. Now that's the superintendent's interpretation. Maybe not everyone's here tonight, but you know, what, school I, event. what I say to my staff is, um, you don't, I tell my staff, you don't get to wear your parent and teacher hat at the same time. Which hat are you wearing right now? I don't think you get to come into a meeting and wear both simultaneously. I think you should absolutely get to put your parent hat on. And then there's absolutely times you should be advocating as a teacher. I really try hard not to have them wear both at the same time. But I think what he's saying is like, <clears throat> if you go to say you go to the post office and you get, are you representing the school board at that time? No. But I, would, I could see a situation where Say every time you went to the post office, you're arguing with somebody, and and it's, you know, I can see where that this rule and this policy committee might be tried to apply to somebody like that. You know, like if every time you went to the store or whatever, you, you get into an argument with somebody at the school board about school board's things. No, you're not re representing the school board at that time, but if it was an ongoing problem, I think some uh, the it's board might try to board. apply this, apply this. Uh, Censorship. I don't know. But. Yeah, we can yeah, ask I mean, legal to come in and talk about it further. They did a lot of research on it, so we can ask them to better define that. Yeah. But I mean, if it's just a one-time thing, it's one thing. But if it's like every time, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, I hear you. Uh, or an ongoing problem. You know? Yeah, that's not cool. But I don't know if it would be or not. If it would be, it would apply that policy in, in that situation. I would just like to think that our job is so important that every opportunity we have to win somebody over or at least get them to understand better or just open their mind where they're saying, okay, well, I'm, I'll get more information because that's the way I feel, but I'll get back to you on that because maybe you made me think a little bit more about it. All that helps um, when it gets to the, the ballot box and voting on our budgets or everything else in school policy in this, this, this world. And uh, so I hear what you're saying is that, that there's, uh, we only can do so so much and, and there's First Amendment's rights that are huge, 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 huge. So, you know, I appreciate you educating me on that. All right. So there will be more to come on this policy. And we'll talk through it tomorrow on the um, We also have an update on there was a couple of changes on the flight policy. Do we want to talk about that now? I think we should do that. On do that. On All right. So, um, negotiations council. Hey, Sarah, you want to talk to that where we're at? Sure. Um, we met with the support staff last Thursday. Um, exchanged, uh, both sides exchanged proposals and asked sort of broad questions so that there was understanding of what the proposals were, but we weren't into negotiating. We're going to meet with them, uh, the, not this Thursday, but the following Thursday, where they're coming back with some clarification for us. And, um, but we're, we're off and we're uh, meeting every other week with them. And then we meet, on, we meet as a team on the other Thursday so that we're 
uh, prepared and, and ready to, to negotiate. Questions? Okay. Uh, Superintendent Evaluation Committee, we have a meeting tomorrow night at six o'clock. We meet with Sue um, from the VSBA um, to go over the questions that will be on the survey um, and, and timeline and all of that. So um, that's up for tomorrow night. So Any that's questions? tomorrow at what time? At six. At six. I've forgotten that. Thank you very much. Okay. Kathy, if it's not snowing and bad, I won't be able to be at it. If it's snowing and my what I'm supposed to do it gets canceled, I can be on it. But okay, just so you know. All right, and to, and tomorrow is is really it, it won't be a very long meeting. It's just going to to review the questions, which I'm assuming will be pretty similar to what we've had the last couple of years, to to keep along the timeline. So, what will be about tomorrow night? Um, board mentor committee update. Eric on here today? No, Eric. Um, we are moving along with our board mentor committee. Um, we have uh, not a board handbook, but I'd say it as maybe a handbook. Um, we're putting together like a handbook layout for all new board members with things like acronyms and who you can contact and what you do when you first become a board member and um and ho we're hoping to have it by march have it ready and out to roll by march so there'll be an update on that at next meeting maybe in my first look at it for you guys at our february meeting nice one i think what you're doing is super um now there's no reason why people have to kind of work their way through the the swamps and the weeds of the first year before they feel confident and and being what it what their expectations are and how they contribute to being a good, effective board member. So this is, I think it's going to go a long way. I've got some suggestions. I'll, do I pass them on to you or sure, just, me. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I just think it'd be really, really neat. I also think like to suggest that I don't care how many years we've been on a board, we're, we'll, we're going to learn something from this manual. So mm -hmm. you might think about this being a manual for everybody. Yeah, I think the first year everybody should get a copy. I agree. And what we learned, some of us have already forgotten. So, um, thank you for putting it together. I like the way it's organized and just the uh, level of detail you've got here. Uh, I appreciate. Any questions on the mentor committee? Okay. You guys are easy peasy tonight. All right, uh, number eight, eight point one, act to adopt a thirty two WRVS new flag policy. Maggie was going to speak to you. And Maggie's going to speak to what we've discussed at our uh, committee meeting about flag policy. Yes, I am. Uh, so there's pretty much the, the flag policy stays the same. There have been two um, slight shifts in wording. Oh, good. You have it up. So um, the first one is um, around. Um, um, who proposes the, the flag policy and and really making sure that it stays more student focused. So the original wording um, said so the process. Okay, yeah, that bottom paragraph on page one, the school board will only consider flag requests from the school district students approved school groups. And so that piece that last word there or or staff has been um, removed. So um, just trying to be mindful of like staff influence as opposed to more organic student voices. Uh, the last one is if you scroll down further to section C as in cat. Keep going. There it is after the hearing request. Thank you. I don't know who's driving the show, but I appreciate your assistance. Um, is that um, the, 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 the individual boards uh, make the decision as opposed to having the um, superintendent um, be the middle person, just again, to keep the local um, influence or process, keep the process localized. That's better wording. Well, the second sentence was removed too, remember Maggie? Yeah, so the board, oh, and that the board does not have to provide a 
we're removing the board will provide a written statement articulating why this flag request. Thank you. So what you all have in your packets is the revised version. Is the revised. Yes. Okay, I kept looking for the changes. This yeah, is yeah. that, that is the, the changes. changes. Gotcha. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Are there any questions as to those changes? If you're none, I would entertain a motion to adopt the WRVS flag. I'm sorry. I thought you said there were any questions. I have some comments. Okay. Uh, hopefully this isn't any surprise. I want to start with a compliment to the committee and how long and hard they've been working on this. Uh, in my research, this is not an easy topic. Um, it's Royal School Boards from uh, Maine to uh, Southern California. Um, it's gotten the states involved, legislatures involved, all sorts of stuff going on. A lot of it's silly. But the underlying thing is, uh, in what you're trying to grapple with the importance of giving students not only a choice but a voice and how we do that responsibly and the legal cases that are, are underlying this including the big one in the city of Boston where I used to work where um, the Supreme Court decided that and it makes sense to me that they're, they didn't have a flag policy and in fact the flags are flying were not governmental flags because there is no policy to underlie that. And that's what's driving this, to have the ability of us as school boards and school superintendents um, to decide what we want to do to can help students convey their voice, empower their voice. You have to have a policy. And that's what's what's, what's driving here, what, what you had to do. What you, is unique in my research is that um, it isn't just one policy. It's a policy that each district can develop. And that policy can be uh, dealing with the flag, uh, uh, non-governmental flags on flagpoles, school flagpoles, and or flags in our, inside our school buildings. My concern is not our goal, which is to empower. It isn't fear that the kids are going to go wild. It's our moral imperative to make sure that they feel safe and confident. We give them the open their minds. We open their hearts so that they're skeptical, but they learn to listen. That they are curious about the world beyond themselves and their close friends. They are get thinking about the future and their future is not totally controlled by themselves it's by their environment their community um their uh their families and how we as a schools families communities states countries the world conduct ourselves and, and encouraging them to think about that and then uh, to get passionate about something. And that's where the voice comes in and to constructively channel that voice um, for what they're advocating. What I'm concerned about is that it seems like we're hung up on flags. And in my experience, it isn't flags. And then the flagpoles, it's what we do as individuals, no matter what our age is, to try to make a difference. And I'll just give you, if I can share some, some stories with you. Back in 1965, I was a sophomore at Syracuse University, and a Bloody Sunday in Selma happened. And I was a member of CORE, and we had some contacts with a rural community in northern Louisiana, and we decided to go down there. Some people would call us freedom riders. No, we just went down there because a couple of black churches got burned uh, by the Ku Klux Klan. And it was really tense. I mean, you had Bloody Sunday, you had the, the Klan's uh, reign of terror, they called it, down in Louisiana. You had Lu Viola Luzo, who's this uh, uh, 
white woman trying to do, make a difference in the South. And she was shot down and killed because she had the audacity to pick up a, a black man who had run out of gas. And he was, she was driving him to the filling station. You know, you just don't do that. And then the, on top of that, when we contacted the FBI, the FBI says, hey, um, we can't guarantee uh, warrants. Basically, they can't guarantee or uh, assure our safety much below Cincinnati. Think about that. Cincinnati. We're going down there to help rebuild the church. This isn't about me. It isn't about college students, even though we're pretty damn young. But when we got down there, what were the students doing? at a segregated high school. They walked out of that high school. Why did they walk out of that high school? Because they had terrible conditions, whether it was a, the drinking fountains that didn't work, the heating systems that didn't work, the drinking, the uh, leaking roofs, uh, no, no decent books at all in the library, overcrowded classrooms, and then they, they, that school board fires their black coach for attending one of their meetings. These kids hit the streets, they prayed, they marched, they sat. Uh, television's camera stations came. Uh, we helped as little as we as much as we could. And lo and behold, the, the segregationist governor of the great state of Louisiana showed up because this was too much. And worked out some arrangements where those school conditions would change. Who did that? Kids. Kids. I mean, the parents weren't wrong in this because they saw the danger of their kids out there. They could get mud. They could get shot. They could be. Uh, they could be pushed around. We're not talking about bullying here. We're talking about stuff that's really, really, really serious. Kids did that. And you had another next year out in Delano, California, and the grape strike. I don't know if you followed the grape workers and farm workers in in California. But they worked on, a lot of them were green cards, but they, they worked terrible wages, terrible working conditions, uh, pesticides up and down and around, treating like they, no human being should be treated. And so, that, so they, Cesar Chavez basically said, hey, we're going to go on strike. Well, the kids, the sons and daughters of Cesar Chavez and the farm workers said, we can do better than that. Let's, let's, let's take a walk. Walk where? To Sacramento. And we'll call the kids and all the high schools all the way up, up the way, San Joaquin Valley, and see if they'll join us. And that's where I joined them up because I was a community organizer in Stockton. And so each time, each time they picked up more people, kids all the way along, until we got to Sacramento. The governor at the time refused to meet with us. But that march got, again, galvanized people's attention. And that strike turned into a great boycott of not eating and buying American grown California grapes until things got turned around. Who were the, who were the big pushers there? It wasn't only Caesar Chavez, it was the kids. And then you go eight years later in Boston, Liberty's chosen home, and they had a federal judge that said Boston's public schools are segregated. This is 1974. And you're going to have to integrate them. And uh, I was part of that in a small way, but my part was to try to get the kids to hold the, the temper down, the, to get kids to be able to communicate. Um, and so we had a chance to integrate Boston's public schools. That basically blew up, and I won't go into the gory details, but again, you had kids standing up trying to make a difference. Here, it wasn't enough. Even with a massive police presence, um, wow. And then the black parents having their kids get in on buses. And these kids get in on the buses when rocks were thrown, bricks were thrown. I mean, this was pretty nasty stuff. And my point is, kids do make a difference. They have made a difference. Our, our moral imperative is to help them make a difference. But I don't think have, flying a non-governmental flag on a school flagpole makes a damn bit of difference. Excuse me, that's an exaggeration. It, it doesn't do it. It doesn't do it. And it can also endanger our ability to unite our community behind our educational purpose. 
And that requires not only their support, but their financial support and going to our games and our concerts and 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 and, and linking with the teachers and understanding what's going on here. And I see this as an unnecessary risk for the greater good of that voice. Kids can have that voice in the plays that they act in and the music that they play and the clothes they wear and the and the uh, poetry they write and the letters to the editor they make to the marches to wherever it is. And, it's, and it could be any, for any generation, food insecurity, the environment, um, you name it, they can make a difference. And I would hope that they do, however you vote tonight. But I'd like to propose an amendment basically taking the flag polls off the choice that, and if Rev, you'll put that up, it's the second paragraph of the flag policy, you know. Bill, you can't uh, make a decision if we don't that. have a, uh, we don't have a, a motion on the floor, so there's nothing to amend yet. Yeah, I think you're, I hear what you're saying. He wants to change the policy before we vote on it. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah, but so you you put a motion on the floor and then you. I want I want a motion to amend. Yeah. And there's no motion on the floor. Okay, I hear what you're saying, Sarah. So we, you're saying. Yeah, you need to move it. So I need to. And move, then I need, need a second. It. And then and we need a second, and then we'll have a just. Yeah. And then and then you make an amendment to the policy, and then we vote yeah. on your amendment, and then we vote on the policy. Correct. If he gets a second. If he gets a second. Okay. All right. So do I have a motion to adopt the WRVSU flag policy? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Is there a discussion on the yes. motion? I'd like to move an amendment. Okay. Do I need a second on that or can I go right here? Yes. Somebody has to You a need a second. So but you say what your amendment is. Okay. Um, it's a second paragraph of the policy and I'll read it. Therefore, it is the policy of the WRBSU that each district within the supervisor union should adopt its own flag policy consistent with the procedures set forth herein. Member districts may designate space within the district buildings to hang flags that comply with the requirements herein. And then this is the big change all member district flagpoles on school property shall exclusively fly the United States and state of Vermont flags. Mm. Right, do I have a second? Second. Mm -hmm. I second Bill's. You seconded it, Amy? Thank you. Yes. All right. Any discussion on the amendment before we vote on that? Okay, so now I do a vote on the amendment, correct? So all those in favor of Bill's amendment to the flag policy, I'm gonna go through, do a roll call vote. Um, all those in favor say aye. I'll start with you, Sarah. No. Susan May. Maggie? No. Shannon. No. Amy. Aye. Tammy. No. Sylvia. No. Is there anyone else from the board? Mm -hmm. Aye. 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 A 16 member board, we just talked about this in the policy committee. Right. So, no matter what motions you have tonight, you need nine votes to approve it. Okay, I misunderstood that. I thought you needed at least half over half. No. 
you have 16 members. You need nine to make a quorum. Only a quorum of the board can take action. The Robert's rules, that means you need all nine to say yes. Is that on amendments too? Yes. The board can only take action on a majority of the board. You only have nine tonight, which means you need unanimous votes to take any action. Okay, so the amendment did not pass. So now, um, act to adopt the WRBSE flag policy motion is back up. Is there any other discussion on the motion? If none, I will do roll call for the motion. Uh, Shannon. This is to, to adopt the policy. Yes. Uh, Amy? Aye. Tammy? Yes. Sarah? Yes. Maggie? Yes. Sylvia? Yes. Anybody else up there? Anybody more? One, two, three, five, six, three. Rodney? Yes. Bill? Yes. And Cassie's a yes. Okay. Right. Policy is approved. Policy, the flag policy is approved. Unanimously. Thanks, guys. All right. Board development. The board will re receive part two of our presentation on the changes to special education law specific to Act 173 and how it relates to our ongoing work in creating a comprehensive system of support, MPSS. So it's Michaela and Annette. Yes, well, thanks for having us again um, here for round, round two. Um, this particular presentation is around um, the layers of support um, within a multi-tiered uh, system of supports. Um, and particularly, we'll talk about, um, you know, what intervention um, is and what it looks like and how we get there. And also um, kind of giving some idea between um, the difference between intervention and um, specialized instruction. So you've seen um, this um, particular graphic in our first um, session. We just wanted to um, just give a, a reminder um, of what our MTSS system looks like, right? The universal level it incorporates all students. Um, and then when we um, start to then um, think about targeted intervention, it's for some, and then as we move up for intensive intervention, um, it's, it's few and then it's even fewer when we get to special education, which is really focusing on specialized instruction. So we, we've been working with staffs around this idea of how um, a student is referred to special education and all the process that has to happen before um, that can happen. Um, so we've been really emphasizing this idea of it's, it's a layered approach and it starts at a universal um, instruction, high quality, and then we move slowly through the other layers um, until we can determine whether or not it's actually um, a student has a, um, a need for a special education referral. So we're hopeful that we will continue to see a downward um, data point around referrals to special education because of this process, because we're doing a lot before. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I just, I just saw a note on there too, just to add that that graphic, which I think, do think is really helpful, is actually on our WRVSU website under departments uh, and MTSS intro to MTSS. So should you, if you need, if you need to share it with anyone, mm -hmm. um, that's a um, a way to to get it out to families if you're having conversations and as a reference point. There's probably other places it is, but that's one of the places um, you can find it too as we sort of continue to build up our new website. Um, things like this and, and your feedback that, that it's helpful is good for us as we um, add more information there. Um, so we also wanted to um, educate um, 
the board around. This is not something new that we made up, <laughs> that we have been working with um, the Agency of Education's field guide um, since 2014. It has been in existence and then was revised in 2019 prior to um, going out for COVID. So we, we use a lot of um, the information that the Agency of Education has provided as guidance. And this is all embedded in research. So tonight we're focused on, they have 10 principles we're focused on two tonight around having a comprehensive <coughs> data system um, that supports this idea of looking at um, student data and making decisions, um, as well as having expertise at the building level um, to help support this idea of continuous improvement with students <coughs> and student growth. Um, so this is where we're, it's the foundation of our MTSS is how do we make decisions about students and also universal instruction, like Anna talked about tonight with, with our smart and balanced data, through a, uh, a data-driven decision-making model. So this, this guide has helped us um, create that framework. <coughs> Yeah, so this um, this slide really kind of breaks down the difference between, you know, what intervention um, is focused on and what it looks like at uh, the targeted and intensive level, and then what um, we call intervention or services look like um, when students, you know, then qualify for special education and as part of their IEP get specialized instruction. Um, so intervention is really data and team driven um, decision making, um, same with specialized instruction. It's, a, it's really focused around data and teams and teams making decisions, you know, based on what they have for information um, about their students. Um, intervention is around gap filling. Um, so it's really kind of targeting on um, what is the data showing you are the gaps um, in their knowing, you know, in those foundational foundational skills, whether it be in academics or social emotional learning. And then you really target those skills um, and then progress monitor them along the way. And with specialized instruction, it really is, um, yes, focusing on those skills that are gaps, but generally when a student needs specialized instruction, that instruction is then really long-term. They need that kind of modified or accommodated uh, curriculum to make long-term adequate progress. Um, unlike at the targeted and sometimes intensive level, where it can kind of be more short term and really focused with a kind of an exit goal um, at the end. Um, also at the intervention level, there is a lot of progress monitoring that happens just to make sure that the team is um, you know, meeting on a regular basis and really discussing that student and making sure that the um, intervention that they're using to uh, you know, target that um, goal for that student is is proper, and if it's not, you know, they make they make adjustments. Um, or if a student's made a goal, then then they'll talk about next steps. Um, there is progress monitoring um, when it comes to specialized instruction, but generally um, it lines up a minimum of four times a year, um, and generally progress reporting goes out um, with report cards. Um, with intervention, there's a lot of uh, documented through kind of a school-based targeted intensive plan. Um, we used to call that the EST plan, but now it's a targeted intervention plan, which will follow a student um, basically from grade to grade um, in school to school. Um, so then basically you get this nice long-term um, picture of what the student um, has, has been um, has been going through and what kind of their process has been um, through their schooling. So it's a really nice way to kind of what I call a learner profile. You get this nice learner profile throughout the years. Um, same with, with specialized instruction. Um, there's a lot of documenting and aligning to a student's annual IEP. Um, generally, um, students are reevaluated formally um, minimally every three years. Um, so there still is a lot of documenting um, along the way and you get more of a um, microscopic, I call it, kind of learner profile with specialized instruction. Um, and it's more of a broader 
um, pro learner profile at more of an inter intervention level. Michaela, do you have anything to add? Um, I just would emphasize that we're really focused on documentation. Yes. We were working with our school mm -hmm. teams that, that um, <laughs> the documentation is equitable throughout the SU because yeah. um, schools have been doing differently to ensure that when a referral comes to Annette's desk that they have the proper um, data and documentation um, throughout the, the student's profile. So that's where we've been working a lot with schools around what does that look like. Mm -hmm. And when a referral does, um, you know, come come to my inbox, um, I've designed I designed last year a digital um, referral form, um, and it has a lot of very um, data driven specific questions, um, and I ask for a lot a lot of documentation um, within within that form, um, and. Um, what I generally do is I, I review it very thoroughly. I read everything um, and then I give feedback back to the team. So I reach back out to the building principal and, and um, the team that um, put in the referral um, if I have questions or if something's missing or for next steps. The, just the last slide just shows you, this is what it looks like at the building level. Mm -hmm. um, so there's there's multiple steps that need to happen. Um, so you're, I know the boards will be hearing a lot about track my progress data in February. We're already into that data right now, um, and schools are doing that as well as looking at what does their track my um, progress data look like at a school classroom and then an individual level, um, and then they will determine at the team level what other what we call diagnostic assessments. So it's a deeper dive into what a student may need. Um, so we've been trying to create menus um, of support to help schools and principals understand like here's what you could be here's another level of testing you could do to find dig deeper into a student's um, gaps that they have according to what track my progress said um, and then a team will then decide what, what they're going to target and the intervention that will be used um, and they'll set up um, a progress monitoring schedule where they'll regularly test a student to see if actually the inter intervention is working um, and then if, if a student does not make progress um, after multiple cycles and, and deep analysis and the building principles that has assured us that the universal instruction is also high quality, then there could be a referral for a special education evaluation. But that takes um, a good portion of the year to get to if, if the student doesn't exit. Can we just show, I'd like that board to see that the venue of supports just to give the board some some inkling into um, the resources we provide data teams mm -hmm. looking at different interventions to target academic gaps so these are different approaches to intervention that we can use to address literacy mm -hmm. and so teams can use this as a reference point when they're in data teams to see what is that diagnostic telling us that the student's struggling with in regards to reading? Um, and then the team can use this template to inform what intervention might be the most, well, hopefully is the most appropriate mm -hmm. to target those academic gaps. And if it's not working, again, we could come back to say, all right, if we're not closing the academic gaps, why? Yeah. Is it that? The intervention's not happening with fidelity, right? Like, is attendance a concern? Is it is it that the intervention that we're using is not actually honing in on the skill that we thought it was that the student was struggling with? So when we talk about progress monitoring students, I share that to give you an example of those are the types of conversations teachers should be having in data teams at our buildings about individual students. And that is even when a student's entered into a targeted intervention plan, not, not getting intervention via an IEP. Well, so when we talk about early intervention, that's what we're talking about, right? We want to be talking about kids that aren't meeting adequate progress on a regular basis. And this is a tool that teachers would use. So a lot of PD this year has been focused on building more and more tools with our classroom teachers as well as our interventionists. So Anna's been working all year long with the interventionists around how, mm -hmm. how do we continue to build their expertise so they can be um, support at the data team level. Nice.
Yeah, so what it what it really comes down to as part of this multi tiered system of support and also what just what Act 173, you know, provides us is that we're able to provide kind of all of this, this, you know, menu that you see, you, you're able to see that we're able to provide a lot of intervention early as possible um, instead of having to wait. Um, until you know we feel like a student then qualifies for special education so it's just wonderful that we now have these these resources and the ability to um, catch students early and have conversations about students early i mean early as you know three years old when they're in our preschools um because i know our preschools are starting um, an early mtss system i've been working with renee so it's just wonderful that um that we just we have these you know these um, items now, and this this ability to do this to catch catch students really early and not have to wait. So this is really exciting. <clears throat> Back in business school, there's an old adage: uh, "To manage is to measure." Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm a big advocate of that, but it's clearly not the only thing. I mean, once you've got the data, you've got to figure out well, what am I doing. And how can we change it and make it better? And what I like about this system that you're implementing and effective on is you, you're not afraid of the, get the data, get the measurements, and you're not afraid of saying, hey, is it working? If not, let's figure it out. And it's our responsibility as the leadership team to, to help the teachers and our and, and educators with the right tools so they can, that, that data can turn around. And that's, to me, a, a formula for, for potential success. Any questions, guys? Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Audit updates, possible action. So there's no action on it tonight because it's not attached to your packet. And as far as the updates concerned, I'm just waiting on the revised draft of the SU audit. Hopefully, I'll have in the next day or so. All looking good? So far. Projections that I had for central office were on par throughout the year. Good. All right. So public comment. Raise your hand um, if you have a public comment tonight. All right. Hearing none. Resignation new hires. <coughs> Nothing. Uh, any other business? Okay. Future agenda items. But the audit, you'll get your SUY track plan progress data. Um, we'll probably be ready for our first reading, uh, potentially, um, of the policy we discussed tonight. Uh, it seemed like the group was going to be willing to move that out. Yep. It seemed that it is. So I'll warn it for discussion. Um, and uh, we'll have a discussion on the mentor committee. That'll Come up at the next board meeting. Oh yeah, we probably uh, the our transportation bids are out the RFP, and so we very well may be ready to take action on a, on a, a bus transportation contract. Nice. Right. I think we'll be in time. Yeah, February ninth. So we're doing yeah. Guys. So. All right. Put some locals up with data. Yep, I said to you. I'm sorry. Um, our next meeting is Tuesday, February twenty eighth at six o'clock. And if there is no other business, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So no moved. Moved. Second in. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Debbie. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.